isn't it time to say, let's stop talking about the rights of adults and painting them as victims mm. without in any way diminishing the challenges they faced mm. and turn our attention to the next generation, the kids, the ones who can't speak for themselves but are actually most vulnerable and most damaged. Yes. Well, again, it's... Um, I think, you know, if we look at what's gone on in our country, um, there has been a stigma around, you know, removing Australian children who happen to be Aboriginal because of... Um, you know, what's happened in our country's history with the stolen generation. And I think that issue has been conflated. I think it's not recognised that within the stolen generation were many other stories than the most popular narrative that we know of that children were removed because of their skin colour um, and, you know, pushed into assimilation. Um, there were, of course, many different stories with re regard to the stolen generation. Many different stories. Many different stories. And that's a part of, again, acknowledging our history in its entirety and not particular narratives. Um, that's recognising our history uh, as, as human beings and not holding you know, all white Australians responsible who weren't even around during that time for what happened in our history. Um, and... You know, the, the, we need to get away. And what I see a lot now is the way the media y use trigger words, you know. They use the term, uh, um, I think, because David Gillespie recently said that, um, you know, he believes that Aboriginal children should be adopted. And I agree with him entirely. Um, but then you get news articles that will say, well, you know, politicians want a second stolen generation. That does not, that's no way helpful for those children in those really dire circumstances who are begging to have the same opportunities as the kids who, uh, whose parents run these media organisations who can flippantly use terms like that in order to trigger an audience. They have utter disregard for these kids in those circumstances. And then um, those who are being driven by their ideologies uh, are going to jump on that and use that as their focus instead of focusing again on the children the kids. and these are adults mm -hmm. behaving very selfishly in my view um, when one can't look within themselves to make change because of their own insecurities about who they are uh, that becomes damaging because there's children relying on these adults to be adults and put their welfare first. And uh, I am a big believer that, uh, you know, it, there's a segregation going on with kids in care and Aboriginal children are treated differently to other kids. And this is a result of the Bring Them Home report. This is a result of the stigma attached to the stolen generation. And um, there's a reluctance to remove Aboriginal kids. They should be treated just like any other Australian child. It's and actually as though we have one law for non-Indigenous Australians and another suspended law, or the same law, but it's suspended... Yes. ..for Indigenous people. Yes. And it seems to me to be a gross injustice... It is. ..against Aboriginal children. It is. Gross injustice. It's the racism of low expectations. It's like, no, hands off, we're going to let these kids be in these you know, horrible circumstances where, and we're not going to lift the bar to where, you know, it should be alongside other Australian children. I knew five uh, people, all of them elderly, a couple passed on now, uh, who were removed. Um, and as you say, all of their stories were different. Three of them would have said, one of them actually said, I say it through gritted teeth, mm -hmm. but I'm actually glad. Yes. Uh, three of them would have said they were glad. One of them had a, a full sister who was not. Mm. Both of them were well adjusted and working well in their communities and they enjoyed wonderful family lives. It mm. was nowhere near mm. as simple. And here's the, here's the rub. We're going to this motivation mm. where, I'll use the word, do-gooders 
sitting in ivory towers tell us what we should do for Aboriginal people and refuse to engage in what needs to be done for their children. Mm. I think their motivation should be questioned, frankly, mm. quite often. Mm. Because I think one of the things that they fail to do is to give justice to the motivation of many of those who tried to help Aboriginal people and are then judged for having done it the wrong way when they took children out of different difficult circumstances or sometimes were asked by the mothers to take the children. Yes. That's forgotten. Yes. I'm not excusing it. Mm. I'm not getting into that debate, but I am saying we have been very judgmental of their motivations. Yes. I suspect that those young Aboriginal children we're talking about when they grow up, and perhaps the young white Australian children too who get to know them, will be very severe in the judgments they pass on us. We should not be so smug yes. in sitting in judgment on those who have gone before us, because I think we're presiding over terrible injustices and terrible blind spots. Yes. And I'll say it, a very clumsy racism if we could only see the way we're really behaving. Yes. Am I being unfair? Not at all. Uh, I know of a woman whose story I shared uh, in the lead up to the whole Australia Day debate. She had sent me her story and said, oh, please share this for me, because she was enraged with the way that protesters were so willing to pour so much of their energy into trying to tear down Australia, if you like, uh, and not into caring enough for Aboriginal kids. She's currently in the process of taking to court uh, the Child Protection Agency for not intervening in her and her brother's life. She experienced extreme brutality and sexual abuse um, before she was six years old and right throughout her life. And she's become an incredibly gutsy woman, but she should never have had to endure what she endured. And uh, the agency knew what was going on. The notifications had been brought up for her and her brother, and they were never removed from those circumstances. They were left there because they were Aboriginal. And that is criminal, yeah. in my view. And, you know, it disappoints me when there are Aboriginal people elected into positions of power where they can be uh, speaking out against this or speaking for the children, but they don't. They, they, they continue to toe, you know, a, a particular ideological line and a narrative. Um, and I can't understand why. Um, I know, well, I know it's to avoid the sorts of criticisms that I've been exposed to. Um, and it's probably because they think they're gonna lose that position if they, if they you know, speak the truth. But it's, it's, all, it's all selfishly motivated and it's got nothing to do with what's best for our kids. It is far too common than it should be. And I, I, I worry for the future. You know, we're not going to have, we're not going to have anyone who, we're not going to have these children growing up to be tomorrow's leaders. And, you know, having, right now, I guess that they are simply just existing. And in my view, that is not good enough. It's not good enough just to just simply exist. These children should have the same opportunity as, as any other, you know, Australian child, any other average Australian child in this country. Well, an emphatic amen from me. Mm.